Hey everyone, a lot of you came to my channel originally because of my educational content for Siege, and today I want to go back to those roots and make an educational video for Apex Legends. This video is sponsored by EA. Season Defiance marks three years of Apex and there's never been a better time to download the game and drop in. What I like about Apex the most is that you really feel rewarded for being the better player. In other games like Siege, you can just get randomly sprayed through a wall and lose. In Apex, the better player wins a gunfight and is rewarded with better armor and loot. It's not crazy RNG based like other battle royales. To try Apex now, use the link in the description below. As an added bonus, there are three codes hidden throughout this video, which I believe are PC only. It's first come, first serve. Good luck. I only just started playing last year on and off every few months. This time around, I committed to actually learning the game instead of having my friends carry me, which in turn made it much more fun. Today, I want to pass on what I learned and what I wish I had known before I started playing the game. Number one is a big one. Passives. I only just learned this past month that each legend has their own passive. This is definitely something that I should have known beforehand but was never taught. My friends had always told me that certain legends could do certain things, which I either thought was part of their abilities or because of lore, I didn't know that it was actually a noted passive. Now so you guys don't make the same mistake as me, I'm going to teach you all of the passives for every single legend. Starting with Bloodhound. Bloodhound can see indicators showing actions made by enemy players. These actions can also be pinged to easily inform squad mates. These indicators can last as long as 90 seconds. Gibraltar automatically deploys a gun shield when aiming down sights. Think kind of like Blackbeard for my siege viewers. This shield protects Gibraltar from incoming damage. It has 50 health and has a 9 second cooldown before regenerating when it gets fully broken. If any extra damage is done to the shield over the original 50 health, that damage is still dealt to Gibraltar. You do have the option to disable the shield if you want to, just note that if you do do that and you don't reactivate it, the next time you aim down sight, it won't automatically deploy. Once you enable it again in the future, then it'll start automatically deploying again. Lifeline has probably one of the most useful, in my opinion, passives in the game. The ability to revive teammates without having to go through the animation. Instead, you just deploy a bot and Lifeline can do whatever they want. Now as a bonus clip here, you get to see Annie freaking out when I get her to grenade herself for the clip. I throw him like directly down. <laughs> you good? <laughs> it was so loud. On top of that, Lifeline can also open a secret compartment on blue supply bins, which will have an additional two items in them. Pathfinder's passive occurs when scanning a survey beacon. Every time a survey beacon is scanned, the cooldown of the zipline gun will be reduced by 10 seconds. Wraith will have a voice line activate based on five different situations. These include when they're being aimed at, and more specifically, when being aimed at with a sniper, when there are traps nearby, when there's many enemies nearby, or when there's a lot of death boxes nearby. Now, fair warning, it's a little hard to hear because obviously a lot's going to be going on when you're getting shot at. Bangalore can move 30% faster when either hit or nearly hit by a bullet or grenade. This boost will last for 2 seconds. Caustic is immune to all caustic gas, both from his own canisters and from enemies. He is also able to see enemies moving through the caustic gas similar to how the digi threat works when looking through smoke. Also fun but sad fact, the Marvin robots that give you free loot on Olympus, they will set off your gas canisters and get hurt. I found that out when trying to get a clip of the caustic gas working. Mirage automatically cloaks when reviving teammates. An additional passive that's actually not mentioned on the Legends page is that Mirage also will deploy clones and cloak when getting downed. I can't tell you how many times this has confused me. Octane will passively regenerate 1 health per second after taking no damage for 6 seconds. However, when regenerating after using the stim, you do not have to wait 6 seconds as it doesn't count as damage applied to you. Watson, much like Octane, passively regens over time, but shields instead of health, at a rate of 1 shield health every 2 seconds. Watson's second passive is having ultimate accelerators fully charging the ultimate instead of just 35% of it, and 2 can be carried in a stack instead of just 1. Crypto will automatically mark players, doors, supply bins, care packages, and traps with the drone as long as they are within 30 meters and have direct line of sight. When an enemy gets detected by the drone, they will see drone detected on their HUD. Revenant can crouch walk as fast as other legends can walk standing up. And they can also scale walls six times as high as other legends. Loba is able to see epic, legendary, and mythic gear inside of bins and through walls up to a range of 112.5 meters. This is incredibly helpful for getting early game loot. Rampart has 15% higher ammo for LMGs and the minigun, as well as 25% faster reload time for them. 
Horizon has more control of their aim and can turn faster when in the air, and recovers from landing faster than other legends. Fuse can carry two grenades per slot instead of one, and instead of throwing the grenade can put them in the grenade launcher which throws them farther, 70% faster, and more accurately. Valkyrie has a jetpack that can be used to float around and reach high places. The jetpack lasts for a maximum of 7 seconds and will refill 8 seconds after being used. A full refuel takes 10 seconds. Also while flying from the dropship or their ultimate, enemies within 250 meters and in direct line of sight are marked. Seer can see and hear heartbeats of enemies while aimed down sights within a 75 meter range. The lower health an enemy is, the faster the heart will beat. Ash can use death boxes to mark the location of players' killers. It'll automatically mark all the players still alive in the squad. The boxes with a grayed out skull instead of the white knife means that the people who killed that player are already dead. Meaning if you scan it, nothing will happen. Ash is also able to see every death box on the map that is less than 3 minutes old and can ping them for their squad mates, which is very useful for finding locations to engage in. Mad Maggie is able to see the silhouette of enemies they damage through walls and objects. They're also able to move and aim with a shotgun with zero penalty. It's like moving with your weapon holstered. That's it for all the passives. Now staying on a similar topic, number two, classes. Each of the legends are assigned a class which has a possible second passive for the player. Again, something I had no idea about. Majority of the legends are offensive legends which have no added bonus. They used to have a low profile one which made their hitboxes smaller, but that has since been removed for balancing reasons. The next class is Defensive Legends. These ones take 15% less damage and aren't slowed down when hit by bullets. The next class is the Support class, which is the smallest one. It only contains Loba and Lifeline and has no added bonus. The last class is the Recon Legends, which are able to scan survey beacons to see the location of the next circle. A survey beacon can only be scanned once per round, but once the next round starts, it can be scanned again. And scanning takes a total of 7 seconds. Now that covers all the passives, the next two tips are going to be more about movement. Tip number three, holstering your weapon. This is something that most of us learn pretty early on, but for me it took a long time to get used to. Coming from other FPSs where holstering your weapon doesn't really do anything, it didn't make much sense to me to do automatically. But I cannot stress how important it is in Apex, you move so much faster. It's really important for engaging and escaping from gunfights. Having that extra movement speed can get you there just that much faster and can completely change the tide of battle. One thing I can give advice on though is to make sure you pull out your weapon before you go through a portal. You can't pull it out mid-portal, so if you're holstered, you will have no gun out on the other end. The amount of times I have run around with my weapon holstered, portal dust, and then just punch the air is too damn high. Learn from my mistakes, have your weapons ready. Tip number four, hip firing. Like I said earlier, this is still primarily movement based as it'll affect how you fight in gunfights. But for me, one of the hardest things for me to get used to was hip firing. I come from Siege. Hip firing in that game is equivalent to throwing. You just, you can't do it. But the hip fire in Apex is amazingly accurate. It's so accurate to the point that when I was learning the game, I would often blame the game for my shots missing. Only when I would watch back the footage, I would realize that while my aim was in the general area of the player, the shots were so accurate to the center of the reticle that I was in fact just missing. They were still inside the bloom, but not in the center. I'm still learning at what distances to aim down sight instead of hip fire, so I can't really say for sure how far away is too far to hip fire. But in any close quarter fight, I will always hip fire. What this means though is that if you're like me, coming from other FPSs where hip fire isn't good, you're going to have to work a lot on tracking. The time to kill in Apex is decently long compared to other FPSs, which means that when I'm playing other FPSs, I don't have to worry about tracking the player. I land a few shots, they're dead, I move on. In Apex, you have to land a lot of shots. When aiming downside, this isn't necessarily the hardest, but when hip firing, it can be pretty hard to keep track of someone while they're jumping around and you're just guns blazing. But don't let that scare you. The more you hip fire, the better you'll get at it. I have already gotten significantly better than the first time I played. For the next few points, we're going to talk a lot about armor, starting with number 5, helmets. When I first started playing, I worried a lot about getting a better helmet, and I would often tunnel vision on trying to get that purple helmet, thinking it would protect me a lot. Only to just recently learn that a purple helmet is not that much better than a blue helmet. The general info you need to know is that helmets reduce the damage of incoming headshots by X amount, depending on the rarity. White, or your starting helmet, will reduce it by 25%. Blue helmets reduce by 40%. And then purple and gold helmets reduce by 50%. Now I don't want to bore you with the math details, but this is the formula for headshots in Apex. 
which means that if we assume a shot is going to do 20 base damage, that means blue and purple helmets have a damage reduction difference of 2 damage. Since most guns will do less base damage than that, it means in most cases the damage difference would be 1 damage. In other words, going out of your way for a purple helmet isn't really worth it if you already have a blue one. It's not by any means bad to grab, but just don't focus too much on getting it. Number 6, Evo Shields, commonly referred to as Armor. The Evo Shield you start with can be upgraded through damage done to other enemies. It starts with 50 shield health and can go up to 125. First it'll take 150 damage to go from common to rare, then 300 additional damage to go from rare to epic, then an additional 750 damage to go from epic to mythical. When leveling up, your evo shield won't automatically fill up the new bar. You will have to do that yourself. Also important to note, dealing damage to downed enemies does not count as progress. I can't tell you how many times I just unloaded into a downed enemy thinking that I was cheating the system. Evo shield progress is tied to the shield itself, not to the player. Meaning if you have blue armor, and you kill someone with blue armor, and they have more progress than you, it is always worth it to swap to that shield. So when looting dead bodies, make sure to actually check their progress. It'll even tell you if it's worth it to swap or not. Now that we know how evil shields work, number 7, how to heal the shield health. There are multiple ways to recover shield health, and the most common being shield batteries and shield cells. Cells will always heal 25 shield per use. Batteries recover 100% regardless of the level of your evil shield. Now on top of batteries and cells, there are two main alternative methods to recover your shield health. The first being finishing off a downed player, which will fully replenish your evil shield for free. The trade-off is that you're stuck in an animation and vulnerable, and if you get hurt while performing the action, it'll get cancelled and you get nothing. So you should really only do this if you know you're safe. The second method is to upgrade your armor in the crafter. Normally it just contributes 150 progress towards your evil shield, but if you put in damaged armor, it will come out fully replenished. Now the trade-off for this is that while it's in the replicator, you have no armor at all. So if you get jumped while it's crafting, you're going to be in your weakest possible state. You've heard me cover common, rare, epic, and mythical armor. But there's actually another tier of armor that we haven't talked about yet. Number 8, legendary armor. Also known as golden armor. Now when looking at the evil shields, you might wonder, they both offer 100 shield. Why would you ever take legendary over epic armor? Because epic armor can move into mythical armor, but legendary can't. The reason why is for the passives. Each piece of legendary armor has its own passive, and we're going to go through that right now. First, with legendary helmets. Any player with legendary helmet equipped will have their cooldowns reduced by 20%. This applies to both abilities and ultimates. So generally, you want to give this helmet to someone who's going to be using their abilities or their alts a lot. Someone like Bloodhound. The passive for legendary evo shields is that syringes and shield cells will heal twice as much. So instead of 25 health for a syringe, it does 50. Instead of 25 shield health for a cell, it does 50. Which means that generally, you don't need to carry shield batteries or med kits, as you can heal just as much with two syringes or two cells. And like we mentioned earlier, the trade-off is that this armor cannot be upgraded to mythical level through damage. It is always capped at 100 shield health. So pro tip, if you ever do end up picking legendary armor, make sure to swap your shield batteries for one of your teammate's cells. That way they can always heal up 100% if they need to, and you can just use cells. Now this next piece of gear isn't necessarily armor, but it still has a passive that I want to talk about, legendary backpacks. Now the passive for this is that when reviving teammates, they're revived at 70 health and 50 shields instead of the usual 20 health only. This can be absolutely massive for trying to get back into a fight. Normally if you revive someone and you get jumped, the person you just revived is going to get downed almost immediately. That would no longer be the case if you have a golden backpack. Now the last piece of legendary gear that we're going to talk about is the knockdown shield. A player with a legendary knockdown shield has the ability to self-revive. Normally reviving a teammate takes 6 seconds, using a self-revive takes 12 seconds. This can be pretty useful because if you are in a team fight and you get downed and neither of your teammates can come pick you up, you can self-revive while they keep the enemies busy and you can get right back into the fight as soon as you're up. However, when you do use the self-revive, it reduces your knockdown shield down to an epic after one use. And an added bonus for a knockdown shield, if everyone on your team is down, your squad will not be automatically eliminated. Whoever has the knockdown shield still has a chance to self-revive. Most squads will know this and will hunt down whoever has the self-revive, but it has helped in the past, so you might as well try to use it. Now tip number 9, the last tip about armor. We're talking about armor swapping. This is something that I like to consider more of a veteran tactic, but I'm sure it's seeing more and more use as it's incredibly helpful. 
If you're in a fight or have just finished a fight and you lose all of your shield health, you can swap your armor with one on the ground or in a death box and have fresh armor to keep fighting with. This cannot be done infinitely, as once a player intentionally drops their armor, it will keep its original health. However, when a player dies, the armor in their death box will always be at full health. Swapping is significantly faster than using a cell or a battery, and doesn't leave you as vulnerable for the most part. Armor swapping is incredibly important late game, but can also be used early game. All those common armors you see laying around that most people consider useless, you can easily swap them in the early game gunfights to keep extra health over your enemies. The only downside to armor swapping is losing potential progress for damage, but that's a worthy sacrifice to stay alive longer. And in case anyone watching is still a little bit confused as to how armor swapping works, I'm going to have some footage playing here to show you what I mean. I've tried to record this part like 15 times over trying to explain it in a way that makes sense, but I just keep stumbling over the words because it's a little weird to explain and much easier to understand once you watch it. That's all of my tips for armor. Now we're going to move on to number 10, ammo effects or ammo passives. There are a lot of passives in this game. There are seven types of ammo in Apex, each with their own properties and effects. These ammo types are light, heavy, sniper, arrows, energy, shotgun, and supply drop ammo. Light ammo has higher fire rate but also deals less damage overall. Heavy ammo deals more damage but will travel slower and has a faster bullet drop. Certain guns that use heavy ammo can also open doors when shooting at them. Sniper ammo has the ability to pierce through players, which means you can hurt two players if they're standing in a line. Arrows have the ability to be picked back up after use. When they hit a wall or the ground, a player will automatically pick them up when walking over them. Now if you hit a player with one, when you loot their body, the arrow will be in the death box. Energy ammo travels faster and has less bullet drop compared to other ammo types. Shotgun ammo comes in the form of pellets, so you can do multiple ticks of damage per shot. Other than that, there's no real passive to it. Supply drop ammo is found inside of supply drop weapons. Each weapon will come with a set amount of supply drop ammo. This does not go into your inventory, it's inside the gun. That also means it cannot be dropped or replenished. Once the gun is out of ammo, it's done. Now those were the top 10 things I wish I'd known before I started playing Apex. I do have a bonus, number 11, for you guys. It's a very small one, but it's very useful for PC players. When looting, make sure to wiggle. One strong advantage that mouse and keyboard has over controller is the ability to still wiggle around while looting in-game. This is something that you should always be doing instead of just sitting still. Because when you're looting, if you aren't moving, you are an easy target. Whether it's for snipers or just getting absolutely gunned down by an enemy team watching you. So when looting, just constantly tap your movement keys and keep wiggling. It may not be useful in most situations, but when you get swarmed suddenly, dodging those one to two shots can matter a lot. Now with that covered, that's it for my Apex tips. I want to thank you guys for watching, and I hope I was able to teach you new players a thing or two before jumping into Apex. And I know for most of you who know the game, these tips are pretty basic. But there are new players joining every day who may not know a single thing about Apex. And if that does describe you, I hope you stick with it. I was pretty stubborn about playing Battle Royales, and I wish I hadn't been, as Apex has been incredibly fun with friends. I really do wish I had started sooner. That's going to be it for the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.